Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us, uh, whether it's in person or or online uh, for today's event. My name is Martin Drachik from the Ukrainian Studies Program here at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Next to me is Elena Martinuk, uh, who I'll be introducing uh, in more detail uh, shortly. Uh, the title of today's uh, presentation is Memory Battles and Ukrainian Contemporary Art. Uh, as I alluded to, it's a hybrid event. Uh, so we have a live audience, but we're also online um, and uh, on Zoom and on YouTube. And uh, the procedure is, is as such, uh, we will have a presentation by our speaker, Katerina uh, Yakovlenko, and then we'll have a response from our discussant, Elena Matinyuk, and then we will open up the floor where you can ask questions to our speaker or uh, to our discussant or to both um, as we expand the discussion. Like I said, uh, Today's talk is entitled Memory Battles and Ukrainian Contemporary Art. Our speaker is Katerina Yakovlenko, uh, who is a contemporary art researcher, critic, and journalist. She received an MA in journalism and social communication from Donetsk National University. Yakovlenko has been writing about art and culture in various Ukrainian and European media for more than seven years. For the past six years, she has researched the transformation of the heroic narrative of Donbass through new media as part of her postgraduate thesis at the Ivano Franco National University of Lviv. She worked as deputy web editor at DEIN, the DEI newspaper, from 2013 to 2014, as a curator of the Donbass Studies Research Project at the Izolatsia Platform for Cultural Initiatives, that was between 2014 and 15, and as a researcher and public program curator curator at the Pinchuk Art Center 2015 to 21. Her current research interest touches on the subject of art during political transformations and war and explores gender optics in visual culture. She is editor of the books, Gender Studies by Donbass Studies Research Project, Why There Are Great Women Artists in Ukrainian Art and co-editor of a special issue of Obieg magazine titled Euphoria and Fatigue, Ukraine Art and Society After 2014, and as well as the Curatorial Handbook. Presently, she is a Fulbright Research Fellow at the Scientific Shevchenko Scientific Society in the US. Our discussant today is Elena Martinuk, um, is an art historian with an interest in art theory and philosophy. Her research focuses on Ukrainian and Russian art from the late 20th century to the present. She graduated with a PhD in art history from Rutgers University in January 2018, and she is presently the Petro Yatsik Postdoctoral Research Scholar in Ukrainian Studies here at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. So again, Elena is here physically, but our, our first speaker, Katrina, is uh, online. So uh, welcome, Katrina. I give you the word. Thank you, Marco and Elena, for this opportunity it's uh, really a pleasure to me to talk about ukrainian art and to share some thoughts and ideas what happened the last decades uh, with ukrainian society and intellectual debates i will start uh, share screen now um, and uh, in the beginning we was thinking to start this conversation from the presentation of book uh, of Nikita Kadan, one of the um, uh, key figure uh, in Ukrainian art. Uh, and this book is called Stone Hit Stone. This is his uh, the biggest exhibition uh, in Kiev and the biggest representation of his work. But then I was thinking uh, that it's probably would be fair to give more uh, knowledge and more context about Ukrainian art uh, since 80s and relate this uh, to the topic of the memory. And many critics emphasize that attention to the memory in Ukrainian history uh, and uh, Ukrainian art history emerged in um, 2013 and it started since Yevromaidan happened. And however, I want to start a little bit earlier and begin uh, with the perestroika and first decades of independence. And these times were 
uh, this time was very fragile, emotional, and uh, fervent. And many artists uh, whose career started in 80s say that political and social changes were in the air before the USSR collapsed officially. At that time, they were rethinking their school and tradition of art, even now looking in their works, we asking uh, to whom they belong. Are they still late Soviet artists or the new Ukrainian art? So this uh, questions of identity and tradition of school was very crucial. Um, they tried themselves in new topics and new genres, but they didn't know, know much about the global artistic uh, processes and the movements at that time. And moreover, living in the late USSR, their knowledge about art was very fragmental and consisted of primarily official sources. Only some of the artists got information from unlegal publication and officially literature promoted the principle of Soviet realism, a particular artistic style that was developed in USSR during 30s and until 80s. According to the styles, artists uh, ideologically create their works to show the glory and happiness of the Soviet everyday and political life. The young generation of artists who came to Art Academy in late 80s refused this idea of narration and started creating their own mythology based on different fragments on uh, interpretation of art history, religion, and culture, as well as examples from the history of Soviet, Ukrainian, and Russian art that they were found in a school tutorial. So I will show you some examples of how they rethink the school and the tradition of art. So this is example of Oleg Galesi uh, and his rethinking of Konstantin Makovsky painting. And this one made a little bit later by um, Alexander Hnelitsky, um, the a painting from Nikolai Gea by Nikolai Gea. However, this uh, tradition of rethinking the school uh, even common for the younger generation. And this is example of Lesya Khamenka work. Uh, it's a copy of Viktor Puzirkov painting Chernomorty, which did in Soviet uh, realistic style. And the second one is uh, Ulyana Bichinkova, who uh, make her work to honor to Olga Rapai. She was a ceramist and monumental uh, artist from uh, 60s and 80s. The question of artistic roots and tradition is very crucial for uh, Ukrainian art history that survived after two waves of repressions, uh, the first one in uh, 30s and second one in 60s. The first wave was called as ex executed renaissance and unfortunately there is no exact numbers of repressed Ukrainian intellectuals. And according to some estimates, these numbers might be reached up to 30,000 people. Among others, artists, Mikhail Boychuk, Ivan Padalka, Vasil Sedler, Sofia Nelepinska Boychuk. However, those artists who could survive in such conditions were unable to continue with their innovating technique experiments and avant-garde work. Among such artists was Vasil Yermilov, a Kharkiv-born prolific artist, tried to return to experimenting with the form and rethinking utopia in 60s, however, not successfully, who could not realize any of his works. Yermilov is the creator of a tradition of Kharkiv graphic and design. His idea in sorts were passed down from generation to generation and, uh, to the present day. The information about oppressed artists has been published fragmentally since 60s, but there is no clear and entirely written Ukrainian art history tutorial. Having an innocent uh, interest in the specificity of Ukrainian art, many contemporary artists become researchers and start looking deeply at the archives. For example, you can see the work uh, from UNA Collective. This is Kharkiv-born artist Ulyana Bichinkova, Nika Kudinova, and Alona Salamadina, who start research artists who developed trademarks in 60s and 80s and counting the tradition of Yermilov. And you uh, probably know Yermila works from the MoMA collection because he apparently uh, in the um, main collection of uh, the MoMA. So you probably know his works before. Uh, but going 
further, uh, I want to show you another example. This is like really how an artist become a researcher. Uh, you can see the picture, the portrait picture of Andrei Bayarov. He's Lviv born and Vilnius based artist. And he started to research Lviv, Lviv artistic processes since 80s. And this year he published his translation into Ukrainian, a book about artist group. This group uh, of artists with a different background, but with a strong connection with Lviv. This book was lost. Uh, was about lost avant-garde. Was published in Poland in Poland in seventies, but never before in Ukraine. Bayarov explained his attention to lost history of Ukrainian art, as it his artistic tradition, friends and family. This is the end of quote. Thus, searching archives, he discovers his identity and roots. And moreover, in his own artistic practice, Bayarov was been working directly with the theme of memory and archives, and symbolically, he chosen a photography as his primary media. Um, digging up stories about Ukrainian Jewish and Polish and the Russian avant-garde, which took place on the territory of current Ukraine at the beginning of 20th century, and was uh, repressed artists and critics poses the question of relationship between avant-garde and politics. And moreover, the discussion opens up another questions, to whom does avant-garde belong to? Uh, Oleg Tistel, a contemporary Ukrainian artist who emerged in 80s, since 1985 started works with a series that reminds Narbut money untitled Ukrainian money. Using the same idea of rethinking Ukrainian Baroque as Narbut did, uh, and looking at the national movements and culture, Oleg Tistel raises the question of complicated Ukrainian history, struggle for the independence, political friendship, and treason. Uh, moreover, Tistel believes that Narbut money was the most democratic and popular art form similar to a pop art because it's it was in every house and every person have it at home. Another example uh, is the artistic practice of Nikita Kadan. In one of his interviews, Nikita Kadan says that his generation opposes the historical wind. Indeed, the generation of artists who begin this, his their practice um, between two revolutions, Orange Revolution, I mean, and the Yevromaidan, um, took the convey political and historical issues. It became essential for them to talk about post-colonial historical mistakes, memory, and manipulation. Therefore, working with archives and historical materials become one of the most critical components of his artistic practice. And it's his course emphasizing that the artist provides the basis of the, for the discussion. Like the academic field, artworks involve polyphony of critical opponents, uh, uh, critical opinions. Nikita Kadan works is uh, characterized by several lines, which the author develops consistently. One of them is the connection with unrealized utopian models from the past or destroyed pieces, like you see in this uh, slide there. Uh, a monument to our tomb made by Vanka Vaderidze in Bakhmut in 20s, but it was destroyed later. Um, Nikita Kadan uh, making his references to uh, constructivist monuments um, to honor to cavalryism and his uh, tradition. In his work, Kadam combining the themes of the artistic avant-garde, Ukrainian and Soviet cultural heritage, and the stories of past victims uh, with today's tragedies, the war of Donbass, xenophobia, and persecution of national minorities. In his work, Kadam connects contemporary idea and the struggle to historical experiments, lost revolution, and, and postponed futures. Referring to historical events and works of art, Kadan refuses the ration, a rational approach to history, which usually distinguishes the past from the present. Instead, he creates an emotional interpretation that brings the viewer closer to historical tragedies and shows there an extensible connection with the present day. In this slide, you can see how the artist receives the unimplemented project of Vasily Yermilov, Three uh, Russian Revolutions, 1825, 1905, and 1917, and creates a, a few sculptural forms supplementing uh, in this document or our time cup founded in the work torn house in the Donbass. Um, we create um, 
this book uh, from the stone uh, to the owner of his stone hit stone exhibition the biggest uh, representation of Nikita Kadan's works but also bring some kind of um, context or contextual works that includes Ukrainian avant-garde and Jewish avant-garde work that was um, made and created on the territory of Ukraine. During his career, Vasil Yermila created his works that glorified Soviet utopia and addressing these works today, Nikita Kadan denounced political and ideological past. The artist saw the revolution as a fresh wind that would bring significant changes such as internationalism, equality, social rights and benefits and more. Instead, uh, they faced uh, the real storms that destroyed their um, inspiration and disciplines. Uh, the history of 20th century is when um, the violence permitted uh, everything from the physical pain or torture to words that cut like a knife and the avant-garde poetry included poems of Pavlo Filipovich and Alexis Trilisarenko inspired Nikita Kadan to name this exhibition Stone Hit Stone that was presented in the Pinchukar Center in Kyiv. Um, this seemingly absurd phrase stings as the impossibility of peaceful dialogue and proclaims the struggle with um, adversaries is which nature has endowed the opposes uh, with all its might. Is it notably that Kadan uh, refers to the poetry because according to the British social anthropologist Paul, Paul Connerton, the rhythm of oral poetry become uh, privileged form to remember because the help of rhythm a series of motor reflections of the body formed and combined the work memory and memorialization. Rethinking the past, artists took, uh, talk about the victory and the guilt. And for example, uh, in the Lviv Center of Urban History initiated the prolific intellectual discussion dedicated to the exhibition of Nikita Kadan before and uh, made the historical conference include Ukrainian and uh, international historians who work with uh, uh, topics of trauma, memory and um, uh, great spots of the history uh, and also the guilt. A year before another exhibition um, was happened and this is was created by curator Tatiana Kochibinska and the research platform at Pinchukan Center and the guilt exhibitions examine the issue of the historical and the individual guilt and responsibility. How should one interact with the past and find ways of working with it? Should it be defined, erased or conventionally should one share responsibility for the conflict page of our history. And among such uh, topics, um, the topic of Second World War uh, or triumphant of the Soviet past and the crimes of both sides on the front lines against the civilians was very crucial. So going further, uh, I would show you example. Uh, in 1994, the first uh, reaction group created a project called uh, if I were German, in uh -huh. this series it started black, uh, as a black and white photography. The artist portrayed, portrays himself as early victims of Nazis, as trying on the experience of the Great World War uh, narrative. Each of the photography is shocking, a uh, hyperphonic interpretation of both world history in its own. For example, Mikhailov has Jewish roots, Bratkov and Solonsky have German roots, and Vita Mikhailov, who helped them with this series, was a daughter of Soviet soldier and spent her childhood in Germany. And today, these travesty images can be translated into images of any soldier's uh, concords. Uh, analyzing these works, researcher Inka Shuba says that if I were German is a strong statement about morality and ethics, but not in terms of the values of the society declares of itself, but in terms of how individuals form and pressure which uh, can counteract even in terrible circumstances, regardless of nationality, ethically and re or religion beliefs. 
second uh, artworks uh, from this uh, topic, it's made by Boris Mikhailov indirect student Sasha Kurmas, and it's called Your Sacrifice Were in Vain, created in the cemetery in Kyiv in uh, 2018, and poses the questions of the price of the victory. This telling slogan, like no other, describes the whole tragedy, tragedy of the lost utopia and the triumph of fatigue uh, in the solution of war and had listed without pause for eight years. The artist reject any hierarchy of victimhood and in his artwork, uh, depending on ideological identity, professional occupation, gender, and etc. And instead, he speaks about the universality of the death, res responsibility for life, uh, complaining for uh, the powerness and the art before life itself. What can art do with this case? What images can be compared to the inspiration of creating by life itself? So both these works uh, by Fast Reaction Group and uh, Sasha Kurmas poses the question of who is a hero and what value uh, do they have? This question start um, as a starting point for the exhibition Heroes and Inventory ex exhibition made in National Art Museum of Ukraine in, and started uh, in December 2014 and uh, finished in March 2015. Ukrainian and German curators released the collection of National Art Museum in Ukraine and showed around 180 works from various epoch in the uh, museum's collections, illustrated heroes, saints, martins, and heroic deeds. However, the exhibition does not seek to question to or define which personages can justify, justifiably claim the title of heroes and which um, deed might be called heroic. Instead, the works um, are displaced and the spirit is the traditional inspiration, which the aim of uh, providing historical context for the current debate, which is particularly lived in Ukraine about the notion of heroism and hero heroes as such. An exhibition based and entirely on the museum on holding heroes uh, also reflects a specific aspect of your museum history and development since its founding around the time of changes in 90s and 20th century. And I would also add that this is exhibition start rethinking the primary collection. So after that, they rebuilt uh, the main exposition and include some new works um, that was um, in special fonts before and was uh, not able to see publicly. Um, so among these heroes uh, that represents in the museums were glorified images of Soviet ordinary people, workers, minor metallurgists, and the Soviet ideological machine was always asked artists to demonstrate the people courage, bravery, and happiness in producing their works. And however, what was behind of these vivid characters? Uh, the audio installation I love when Canaries are singing is dedicated to Canaries launch into miners to check the state of the gas. If the Canary was not singing, it uh, indicated the high level of air pollution. The cases of miners dead was an one topic during the Soviet time, and there is no exact data of how many miners died during their work. Uh, and all of these people were forgotten by the state. But in this work, Lea Dostleva, uh, the artist who was born in Donetsk, she poses questions of the value of industrialization and the creation of su successful production statistic. Uh, but going further with the questions of rethinking of a uh, heroical topic, um, I would... Um, uh, show you in this slide the work uh, by Valentin Rajevsky made in 1993 for exhibition Steps of Europe in Uyazdovsky Castle. And this works remind a Kyiv landscape. And um, in the middle of the room, there was a brick hills uh, on which, on one of which um, it was a small monument, which gives a majestic shadows. And you can see in the picture, uh, the artists show how easily society creates influential people and uh, how small sometimes they could be. So he, in his practice um, in the late 80s and um, 
early 90s, he tried to work with the topic of mythology and mostly work with the topic of cave mythology. Uh, notably, the Staples of the Europe was, uh, exhibition, the, was the first uh, representation of new Ukrainian art abroad uh, after the independence and immediately had a huge public resonance. And according to the Polish researcher Orlan Knatyuk, the exhibition convinced the audience that the connection with the history, tradition and myths of the Ukrainian art is so solid and fundamental in this artist um, that their works should not be refused with um, Russians. These two works was made by Sergei Petluk and Evgeny Belarusets in past decades, and they both uh, talking uh, about cre uh, creating myths and debunking, but more interestingly is that they're looking at the situation after this myths fall. Sergei Petluk created his installation fragments uh, comprehending the mythology of the city of Dnipro. Uh, fragments reference to the sculpture metallurgist by Alexei and Yuri Zhidakovim, which Sergei Petluk uh, accidentally found in the Palace of Culture of Dnipro. The focus of Petluk's attention was a shame history, which the society tries to hide and alienate because the emotion of shame and is a strong and unprocessed. Evgenia Belarusin's installation also reminds an interpretation of convented monuments, but uh, most odious uh, monuments to Lenin in Kyiv, which was demolished during the Maidan. Both works raise a question about the past, what happens, what uh, the monuments uh, were ruined. Interestingly, then, in uh, 2016, Isolatsa Foundation initiated the public discussion about the Lenin Monument in Kyiv and an announcing int uh, intellectual uh, debate and open call uh, to ask uh, different artists from all over the world to create several installations, sculptures, and even performances around the monument of Lenin and rethink the ideological space and the place of Lenin. The organization was working with the city council historians and activists, uh, but however, after this uh, work was done, they passed this initiative to the city. And um, after unsuccessful uh, project, uh, the process of rethinking this place was stopped. And nevertheless, the discussion around failed monuments is still crucial for Ukrainian art. And since 80s, some artists have been rethinking the idea of monuments. And there is a couple of examples. For example, Konstantin Vyelanov and Shanna Kadyrova poses the questions of presence of the ideology after its fall and what happens um, after that, who replaced all heroes, which uh, new heroes should be on the pedestal, can society live without heroes or monuments? And for Konstantin um, Vyelanov, um, the answer is empty pedestal, but however, Shanna Kadyrova creates another critical approach. She argues that Ukrainian society has been uh, experiencing a sharp conflict of interpretation of, um, and also uh, one of the most apparent indicators of such uh, differences in historical monuments. She creates a monument to a new monument to show the absurd of memory battle. Uh, it's her first work uh, made in 2009. Um, in Shargarad, but then she also made uh, several copies of this work. Uh, and I also should emphasize that Janna Kadyrova work with local materials such as, um, uh, like for example, if she works with a factory, she works with materials that she found in that exact factory. So she really tried to save this memory of the place. And during the performance, uh, who are still these people who see the same landscape made in 2018, artist uh, Yaroslav Futinsky become a living monument himself. In his work, he addresses a worker strike at a paper factory in 1905 in Paninka Khmelnytsky region, uh, the artist's hometown. During the performance, the artist stands alone against the background and a desolate landscape on a brick rock surrounded by the water. 
exact location where in 1905 strike is supposed to have uh, taken place. This, his left hand was wrapped uh, on the fire resins and materials and raised uh, and burning. The revolution uh, has lost uh, and the memory of its uh, beginning erased of moving into shape of the phantoms and utopias. Uh, this is a citat of um, Nikita Kadan, who I was mentioned before. Uh, based on the revolutionary events on the past and appearing to individual and collective, co collective memory, Futinsky, from the historical perspective, asks the questions of what construct today's political landscape and how uh, can this landscape could be perceived in the future. Uh, this uh, works is very connected to the place. And I mentioned that artist was born in this uh, small town. So he really um, has very deep connection to the history and try to work uh, with archives of his uh, small town. Um, so for some of them, uh, for some artists such as Putinsky or Kadan or Zanna Kadir or some others, it's very important to talk about the um, memory space. And this is another example how artists try to think of uh, what um, a memory has this place. Live broadcast, it's a video works by Jerema Malashuk and Roman Hime, which is thought to have been documentary footage reference to constructing reality and analyzing the meanings of the images of visual age. According to the story, men dressed in military uniform, which resembles the Red Army clothes, perform the dance after a long preparation. That group choreography is distributed by random people who cross the corridor past the dancers. The whole chosen for filming remembers a zone where transgression happens and where the history encounters the present reality meets the fictions and the image encouraged matter. These works was built on the personal experience of artists. They both lived in Kalamilia in one of Frankiv's both walk across the main square called the squares of heroes, but they always was asking to who, which heroes. Unfortunately, there was no monument to clarify this. And uh, they was asking, is it the Soviet heroes or this is the heroes from Ukrainian patriotic army or partisans? And creating these works, artists uh, ask what reality does matter to their generation and what history is close to them and what the memory have this play, uh, the place. Uh, another artist from Lviv, Olha Kuzura, has created a series of works printing of fragments of lost interiors, destroyed houses, and borders columns of non-existing states. Her Lost Presence project uh, recalls it's actually an ongoing project that she started in 2018. Um, she recalls how the post-colonial processes took place and treated in trauma in Lviv. However, this uh, inspired suggestion that uh, Austrian Empire is still presented in human life, appearing as a specific image on paper. And another example um, of the idea of the memory of places is a performative audio tour around the Deal area uh, called the Mendel Bailey's case created by Piotr Lenovsky and Metro Levitsky. In 1918, the right-wing organization Black Hunters initiated a case of Jewish brick factory clerk Mendel Bellius and unjustly ashamed of killing a 12 years old boy, Andrei Yushchinsky. And many public figures defenders Bellius publicly. For example, Volodymyr Karolenko, Alexander Kuprin, Volodymyr Varnansky, uh, Mikhail Khrushchevsky, Sofia Rusova, and many others. And after three, three years of public uh, trial, he was justified. In 1914, Bailey's went to Palestine and then to United States, and he died in age of 60 years um, in uh, New York State. Reminds the complicated Ukrainian history, artists create the powerful work against violence, hate, and anti-Semitism. And finally, my last passage of um, in the connection to personal history and the memories of how the individual experience shapes the history and transform the heroical narrative. 
And the first example from this passage is a work of, uh, made by Katerina, Yer Katerina Yermolaeva. Uh, it's called uh, Blockade of Memories uh, in uh, 2015. Yermolaeva um, based her work on personal experience and memorizing related to her hometown in Donetsk, where she once spent her childhood and uh, adults. Uh, also, her family is separated by war today, and it's impossible to her to, to be in touch with them and to come back home. Uh, at the level of monitor skills, uh, long lost memories, hearts started to emerge and the manifest with the visual images began to appear through the act of interpreting hours of drawing of walls, uh, waterbly performing and a mnemonic function. So you can see all these drawings is, was made by Katerina Yermolaeva in a space of a gallery. And she also had some small real details like scarf or uh, cups uh, or clocks that make the reality uh, this um, installation more, more close to reality. At the same uh, year, Open Group, uh, the artistic group uh, from Ukraine, created a similar work called Backyard it was realized in Venice Biennale uh, and examines two female experiences during the war. Filomena Kuriata and Svetlana Sosoeva were the participants of this project and both lost their homes during the war. Kuriata during the Second World War and Sosoeva during the um, Russian military intervention in the Eastern Ukraine. The open group asked the both women to talk about their lost homes and after that they create 3D models of these works. Uh, artworks also includes video of storytelling, oral history drawings, and actually these models of home. And to conclude, uh, Ukrainian contemporary art is constantly been reaching the social and political changes, looking at the complicated history and getting hidden secrets of out the closet. And however, it's not given clear answer on its finding the solution with an appropriate remote memory. Significantly, it raises the questions that have never been um, discussed and it makes them an intellectual and critical agenda for society today. Uh, thus, Ukrainian contemporary art is often a political act and opens the, defines a space of critical thinking and civil rationality when recalling the past and analyzing the present Artists ask themselves, who are they, uh, where the space, where the place is, and what future we want uh, for us. So thank you. This is uh, my was my last point, and I hope to hear uh, comments from Olena and you, Marco, and maybe some questions from the audience. Well, thank you very much, Katarina, for a very informative and offered us very broad perspective of how memories dealt with in different regions, in Ukraine in different ways by different pop artists. So um, now I invite Olena Martinuk uh, to discuss and to provide her commentary. And I'll be back to field some questions. So thank you, Katerina, for this very informative, fascinating, uh, truly um, kaleidoscopic array uh, of practices that you uh, have uh, like uncovered in front of us. And uh, um, I just I was making notes to myself um, uh, in terms of materiality of uh, these responses to memory. It's such a wide um, uh, choice of um, uh, um, how the artist uh, selected the response to uh, the memory issues is um, with books, articles, research, uh, with um, some artifacts like real uh, found artifacts like this Nikita Kadan's mug, which is tortured uh, by current uh, um, war in the Donbass, uh, or um, actual artworks from the museum um, are looked at uh, not as objects, but um, as parts of some kind of huge archive about all this history uh, of Ukraine that is being 
uh, certainly very actively re reconsidered during the last 30 years uh, that your talk so efficiently spans. Uh, so uh, also we're talking about monuments um, and uh, this very uh, interesting rethinking of their function. Um, also uh, the emptiness uh, which is generated when the ideology, ideology is voided. Uh, even, uh, of course, uh, the photographs are uh, the like the most well-spread archival material, uh, but uh, uh, also uh, such um, uh, things which are very in indeterminate, but still uh, very important, like uh, landscape, uh, public square, um, uh, which uh, could also be memory sites and could be analyzed um, in an artistic way. Uh, so I think in my response, um, uh, I would really like to uh, uh, have a bit of a summary uh, of um, um, both theoretical and uh, probably uh, also in hope to generate some uh, discussion further um, uh, to also see the nuances uh, of the responses between different generations uh, of artists in Ukraine. And um, <clears throat> uh, you have provided this very uh, helpful, convenient rubrics uh, through which you um, kind of group um, these responses and uh, uh, the, the question of uh, tradition, school arises there, the question of hero, this question of the researcher, the question of the avant-garde, of course, and uh, um, basically since um, the very inception of the Ukrainian contemporary art, um, the discussion of both the avant-garde and um, the failure of the communist project it is something which is a uh, very pertinent, very important part um, of the reconsideration of past, uh, since, um, as you said, um, we are talking about the a series of prosecutions, purges. So um, when the history is being eliminated um, and uh, artists obviously reacted to this elimination in a very strong way. Uh, but um, speaking of uh, a theory first, very briefly, um, when you're talking about uh, memory and uh, the way it's preserved, of course, um, the question of the archive uh, and how it was conceptualized during this last 30 years, which uh, Katerina Stokes uh, uh, covers, um, uh, really um, come to mind. And also the fact how important the issue of the archive was for, like, let's say, um, uh, this critical philosophy. Um, uh, which like initially were associated in the 80s, 90s with postmodernism. And um, uh, of course, um, Derrida's book Archive Fever of 1996 comes to mind where he analyzes um, uh, uh, like Freud, the concept of uh, circumcision and um, uh, the death drive present in the archive. Uh, but even before that, uh, when Derrida was writing, let's say on ap Apocalypses, um, in the early 90s, um, uh, for him, uh, what is in, what was very fascinating for me uh, is that the apocalypse was not the elimination of the humankind, but uh, the most horrific apocalypse for the Rida was the destruction of the archive. So uh, apocalypses exist not uh, when um, a human biological uh, form perishes, but when all this cultural depository uh, is kind of being destroyed and then um, the civilization as such um, ceased to exist. Uh, so this archive fever, um, Derrida uh, uh, picks up very important issues like this connection to uh, authority uh, of archive being uh, transparent and concealed simultaneously because it's always kind of uh, there hidden from public view even though uh, it promotes uh, this openness, but um, uh, it's, uh, it has this, um, well, uh, element of authority and, um, um, and, uh, and also 
some kind of inaccessibility to it. And also the violence of archive that uh, the archive um, cuts, uh, the archive destroys. So uh, not everything uh, gets to be part of the archive. So uh, all these parts that are uh, put away, so like sort of get circumcised, uh, uh, so they kind of permanently wound um, uh, this body which carries some. Um, uh, the body of memory which carries this uh, uh, marks of trauma or the circumcision uh, so uh, let me i have this uh, funny well interesting quote of derrida uh, so uh, about what archive fever was so it is to have a compulsive repetitive and nostalgic desire for the archive and a repressible desire to return to the origin a homesickness, a nostalgia for the return to the most archaic place of absolute commencement. And of course, um, this uh, nostalgia and desire go back to the origin was very important for Ukrainian artists when the Ukrainian state is being born. Uh, so uh, figuring out uh, uh, what uh, uh, was um, the most important parts uh, of the Ukrainian art history, which were erased, all these purges, this immense sense of loss, loss uh, which permitted um, this generation, which considered how they um, were like disconnected from uh, history. And uh, this idea of disconnect uh, is actually uh, was developed more by uh, a second very important figure who discussed archives was Hal Foster, uh, who in 2004, uh, has, has written about archival impulse. And um, Al Foster is talking about, of course, this postmodern uh, way of uh, rethinking the tradition in which um, um, the artists uh, quite often produce uh, very personal um, uh, counter, um, uh, what do you say, uh, counter archives. That's what he says, counter archives. So, um, when um, um, uh, he, uh, Hal Foster uses um, uh, Michel Foucault um, question about, well, how archive orders, uh, orders the hier hierarchy of knowledge. And uh, uh, many artists, they want to change a status quo. And we see actually this happening in later uh, generation of artists who would, uh, in Ukraine, who would appear in after Orange Revolution, and they want to kind of shift accents. They want to um, understand who is in charge of the archive, uh, who produces knowledge, uh, and um, uh, so. Um, but in, on the artistic level, uh, these uh, archives, um, as Hal Foster puts it, quite often are paranoid uh, and um, uh, uh, sometimes utopian. And uh, I think, uh, and the third uh, uh, book I want to mention in terms of study of the archive and memory is um, Mariana Hirsch uh, um, about, uh, who, who writes about um, this um, post-memory um, issue, very important uh, for um, actually, I would say the most recent generation of Ukrainian artists. Uh, when we are talking about memory of World War II, memory of Holodomor, which was this induced, um, Stalin-induced famine, memory of purges, these are always uh, post-memories. They are not uh, um, uh, uh, direct memories. So uh, uh, we are using the archives, personal um, um, belongings, uh, personal photographs to kind of recreate uh, uh, memories and uh, she's talking about um, uh, primarily uh, memory of some catastrophic events and Holocaust in particular. And uh, for I, I would say the, the latest Ukrainian generation, like um, Andriy Lyadostival, for instance, uh, we see uh, both direct citation of Marianne Hirsch, but uh, obviously it's something which became actualized by this current war in the Don Donbass, when this uh, very traumatic um, 
a post memory uh, is being um, in very uh, raw, uh, raw uh, contact with actual very traumatic events, uh, event uh, with uh, war mutilating the public Ukrainian body. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to move uh, to my questions now. Um, more um, hopefully that we keep in mind this uh, all um, arch archival concepts, uh, conceptualizations. Uh, so even though for uh, all generations of Ukrainian artists of independence era, both issues of avant-garde, uh, memory of World War II, memory of Voldemort were very important, but I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, they dealt with these memories in a very a different ways. Um, and, um, um, but uh, let's say for the uh, issue of avant-garde, for instance, for this older generation from which you start, Katarina, uh, the 80s, um, um, I, I feel like uh, uh, when they analyze avant-garde, they they see some totalitarianism lurking in there. Um, and, um, but mostly they look at it through this lens of tremendous loss um, and this emptiness that could be covered with this baroque overproduction of uh, meanings and uh, uh, like painterly matter as on real on canvas, you see empty pedestal, but even though the pedestal is empty, there is so much which is so much going on around this pedestal. There is um, kind of naked figures in some erotic postures, some kind of um, 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 multiple layers of patterns, ornaments. Uh, so uh, this sense of um, urgent necessity to fill out the gap uh, was very important um, for this generation, but also this transgression uh, of which Hal Foster is talking about into private uh, um, erotic manners. In, in transgression in general, um, this travesty you mentioned about uh, um, uh, Mikhailov project is very important. Meanwhile, uh, younger generation, I think um, when talking about um, avant-garde um, legacy, let's say, they are kind of uh, dead serious. Um, there is no playfulness and irony there anymore. Um, they kind of mourn this failed utopia. They um, uh, mourn the failure of revolution uh, promises. They mourn at this universal claim of revolution, um, which was lost and now they're kind of uh, uh, let uh, to deal with these two local issues. And, um, and we see so much interest to the Soviet uh, uh, among uh, this uh, younger generation, uh, certainly prompted by decommunization laws, but uh, also a bit of, uh, I think, sadness for this lost uh, last grand style of the 20th century, the socialist realism but also the sympathy for the style which is being persecuted right now due to uh, decommunization laws and uh, some people who took uh, too much uh, uh, um, their uh, implementation in their hands. Um, so my, my questions, uh, uh, again, are very general to you and uh, uh, maybe you will choose to respond to uh, some of them. Uh, so the question of um, Ukrainian identity is the first question. And um, uh, currently, uh, I hear it in, in, in so many uh, voices that it's kind of a, an improper question. Um, it's a kind of um, question to, uh, to suspect of nationalism. And um, certainly Ukraine is this um, multinational state. But uh, I think for um, the 80s generation, it was kind of so natural 
to think about what it means to be a Ukrainian artist just because uh, it, the Soviet Union was collapsing and they were kind of forced to formulate what it was uh, to be a Ukrainian artist, especially when they started to exhibit internationally, they went to Moscow, they went to everywhere. And uh, this question of identity, uh, I think very much connected to uh, the question of memory, but again, both generations react uh, very differently to this. Uh, and um, I, if you have any comments on that, I would be glad to hear. Uh, then um, in general, if you can, uh, comment about the difference between the generations and if you see some kind of line uh, that separates these generations, how they deal uh, with issues of memory. And also uh, one question, the last question, which uh, uh, of the big questions that uh, recently bothered me quite a lot uh, since um, Ukrainian art history and Ukrainian art in general, uh, it develops in this kind of accelerated speed uh, since 80s because uh, there was this big gap that when only socialist realists um, officially existed and artists were catching up with history. Uh, but, um, but still, uh, there was so much of this unwritten history that even if we are talking about uh, this big movements, big movements of the 80s. Uh, the books about them were written in 2015. They're being written right now. Uh, so this history is still not very much preserved. At the same time, we have this growing uh, uh, trend, which, for instance, uh, in your talk is represented by Futimsky. And uh, um, uh, is this kind of attention to very, very local history, uh, this decentralization idea that, okay, uh, these uh, artists in the center, they are no longer interesting for us, uh, but uh, we should dig some kind of very obscure, very local uh, history and kind of create more nuanced picture. Um, but, um, um, I see certain limits to this decentralization in Ukrainian case in particular, when kind of we don't have this bigger history written um, in a very comprehensive way so that all this local peculiarities can be crushed against it. So I wonder if you have any thoughts uh, on this matter. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going to conclude here, and I'm curious to listen to your comments. Thank you so much again for your fascinating talk. Thank you, Elena, for all these questions. Really a lot to maybe comment and to discuss. Um, I hope I wouldn't miss anything from it, but probably I will start from the question of identity. And I think, um, I mean, of course, it's... Uh, quite easy to have these differences between two generations, between that one who emerged in 80s and that one who uh, starts their career uh, after the Orange Revolution. But I think it's quite hard to me, especially to like clearly see all these differences between generations, between uh, both of them, for example, was another generation that emerged and that was supported by um, uh, Center for Contemporary Art, uh, Soros Contemporary Art Center, and they was somewhere lost in the art history because they can't uh, produce in artworks or they can't continue in the, um, artistic practices or they continue in but maybe in more marginalized spheres because they was um, displaced by new artists who come later so it was a little bit complicated so this is to me kind of lost generation of ukrainian art um but also we have now well like super fresh artists i would not say that this is andri and lia doskliva but maybe someone who, who like uh, roman rema 
um, who is like 20 years old, or for example, uh, Tamara Turlun, like, like really young artists who look into the questions completely different and they not having this, actually they not have any connection to Soviet times. They was born in uh, uh, independent Ukraine and they uh, was raised uh, in independent countries, so they really do not have any such connection. So I think that for like really young artists, the question of identity, it's not even a question. They, um, and also because they was growing uh, in a global, uh, global perspective, they have very, com uh, uh, complicated identities, like for example, they are uh, Ukrainian, they also could be born like someone from Donbass, someone from Ivana Frankisk, and this is also creates the identity. Uh, it's also important they are woman or the man or the they, for example, because now it's also very um, um, important question in Ukrainian art, uh, the question of gender uh, topic and LGBT plus um, identity. So this is like really broad and sometimes could be complicated. So it's not uh, connected to the question of national movements, I say, because it's just like really includes different uh, uh, topics and um, if we we'll go, uh, if I will go to the question of uh, absurd and um, that you said that in eighties and nineties it was more um, a performative and absurdic uh, um, uh, interpretation of historical works. I would say that this is absurd was transformed from ironical to analytical, but it still exists. Uh, for example, we can see clearly this is in uh, Sasha Kurma's works. He really like continues this logic of uh, Boris Mikhailov practices. And um, as I said, the, he is not uh, direct uh, his uh, student, but they talking a lot uh, and they still uh, very connected. And there is Mikhailov, um, like really seeing that Sasha is his student. So um, it still exists, but maybe this performative acts, it's not so, um, it just a little bit because of our perspective and our perception of some topics was changed. So um, the form of how artists poses questions, it's also a little bit changed due to the time. Um, uh, also, I think that it's not sometimes a nostalgia because for nostalgia, you have to remember something and you have to maybe know to what, uh, what period you have this um, um, sensitive uh, moments and remembrance. But I think this is really interest of the whole history, what was happened. And of course, some of the artists, they really like uh, the idea uh, the utopian ideas of 20th century, but I think it's because it's like really fascinating global history. Um, and uh, it's more fascinating that you don't know some uh, spots. And of course, like for example, for um, uh, Makola Ridney, uh, this uh, history of 20th century is very connected to his family and he tried in his works to search more what happened with uh, his grand grandfather. I mean now the um, work of great horses. Um, so I would not say that this is like clear nostalgia that uh, we, can, um, we can name it like that. Um, also um, about archives, um, my point is that, of course, artists like look into archives and works with archives, but they're not historians, so they can't give clear answers and they can, they works can be used as a clear and truly 
right information source. This is always interpretation. And uh, in this case, it's really important to know um, what information does they use and uh, who was created this archive in, in which conditions was uh, um, before this creation and uh, why it survived and, and what was lost from these archives. And I think that it's really important to like see how, I mean, maybe maybe Nikita Kadan gives some answers and try to make this like clear statement of his artistic practice, but in general, I think uh, mostly artist interests interest of um, allies and the personal stories. And this is, I think, what really different between this generation and that one who um, uh, emerged in 80s, because now they more trying to look uh, to small examples to personal in personal stories. Uh, but the previous generation was like really thinking more globally. They like really want to search everything that was happened all over the world or like, create like huge works that was that would be um, represent the global and broader narratives. And um, what else? Ah, and also I would especially say thank you for this mention of uh, the materiality aspect. I think it's really important. And uh, I think that last um, uh, last decade it's also uh, was another trend emerged. This is like the um, when uh, artists tried to build the fiction stories, uh, they uh, try to uh, use this like narratology and create like something which pretend to be real, but it has a lot of fiction elements inside. Um, but I think this is because they really try to find the way of connecting with uh, present day. Uh, for example, um, using this materiality, they could like find this connection with their reality. Um, uh, you said about these cups uh, that was found in the Donbass, uh, but also it could be a real photography from archives. It could be some uh, textile uh, things, like for example, uh, Stanislav Turina is doing some other like small details that they use in their works. Um, I hope I didn't miss anything. So if so, just ask me. <laughs> thank well, you. Thank you, Katya. I really, really like your comments and uh, I have even written down for myself about the absurd going from uh, transforming from ironic to analytical. I really uh, agree uh, with this um, um, uh, like analysis that you give uh, when uh, the generation changes. And uh, uh, indeed, um, when we talk about archive, we are not only talking about uh, the material or actual historical archive, but in general, the concept of the archive that the artists are working with. And uh, that's um, a very, very like important topic globally for the last couple of decades and for Ukrainian artists as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elena, for your um, commentary and for the discussion and answer to the question. Uh, I'd like to open up now to people to see if they have any questions for our, our speaker or either of our presenters today. We do have an online question from Svetlana Biradereva. Uh, hi, Katarina. Thank you very much for this fascinating and very informative talk. I have two brief questions. Do you think that recontextualization of Ukrainian avant-garde and socialist realism in contemporary art fosters remythologization of the past in a way its reappropriation in Ukrainian culture with the creation of a new myth that suits today's reality rather than explicitly expressing a nostalgia? That's the first question. And uh, the second question, and you just referred to this in your response to Elena. In his work, Sacrifices in Vain, Sasha Kurma seems to reflect on the 1977 work slogan, 
by collective actions. A red banner in winter trees saying, I am not complaining and I like everything, even though I have never visited these places and don't know anything about them. Do you think Kurmaz also uses a similar mechanism of euphemism and ambiguity, subverting what he literally say, says in the band? Two questions. Uh, so maybe I also will add to the first one. I already think I respond for the nostalgia, but I think that maybe more relevant is a term of nostalgia for rethinking uh, Soviet past for uh, such generation. Um, and going to Sasha Kurma's question, yes, I think he uses this form of uh, artwork. Um, but creates in another way a little bit. So it's like, because sometimes it's, you, you can have, you can do these references, but it would be not clear references just to this artwork. He just used this form, I think, um, but not making this um, bridge uh, from his work to the collection actions. Um, Yeah, and I think that this is like really a case when he put in this absurd just to um, just to see the reaction of the public because I mean of course I think that uh, Sasha did not think that all lives was not matters I think that he thinks that all lives uh, and deaths are matters so that's why he like creating this. Um, um, he he tried to see what will happen after this works, and this is like very common for artists because they try to they not given like real things. They sometimes could uh, provoke people, and it doesn't mean that they feels like that. They just really want to open up discussions and talk about this. And I think that he really um just because of war and he uh before uh, the war for example he was in Donetsk in the residency um, that creates by Izalatsa and he knows these people he really have this connection he do not believe that it wasn't failed but he asked these questions because he wasn't have it in the future he uh, doesn't want to feel guilt that we lost something or something like that um yeah i hope i i answer this um thank you katrina uh, Alana, would you like to comment or anything on those uh, either on the question oh. or on katrina's response oh I, I think yes thank you svetlana for bringing this collective action group slogan which is uh, truly fascinating but i also i see the uh, trajectory not direct, but through uh, Mikhailo, who was uh, very much connected to uh, Moscow conceptualism and uh, influenced it. So, and hence uh, Sasha Kurmas uh, is um, uh, absorbing the tradition through Mikhailo, uh, so to speak. But uh, um, yes, adding this absurd elements, which, as you said, persisted throughout, um, and meanwhile, talking about such very difficult uh, issues as uh, war victims, uh, displacement, um, is a um, um, well, aud audacious act, but still uh, also kind of opening um, the discussion about, in general, how do we talk about traumatic uh, events and uh, memories which are painful. Uh, I just uh, also remember another work that uh, was made uh, just recently by Jura Belay, who is Ukrainian um, artist, but live in Poland. And he creates also, um, he uses this uh, collective action idea of uh, um, go into the public with slogan. And uh, he just recently make a work 
I have a lot of sense of security, a specialty desk that he refers to migration policy, policy of Poland. So you can check it, uh, um, uh, this idea. So I, I think they like doing this because they want to show, um, of course, the connection to the global art movement, but also um, to make the statement maybe more clear and more um, broader. Um, and um, commenting the um, discussion around um, memory itself, um, I want to say that um, it's really a difficult question right now. And uh, sometimes it's really hard to find a solution, especially if it's connected to uh, pedestals and monuments, because for some people it's really fresh and fragile history. But I think that it's, um, it's really great that the conversation have been started and this conversation included very uh, diverse and many actors, um, not only historians, but also artists and uh, intellect intellectuals who rethink in this, because it's really gives um, a big opportunity to discuss not only such questions, but also uh, re-traumatized maybe some historical events and even that events that happens right now in Donbass and Crimea. Well, thank you. I think uh, if there are no more questions. I think that's a good note to end on the fact that this uh, it's, we have questions from our audience. Um, asked, <laughs> yes, uh, discussion. Uh, the discussion is going on and that, that's very important. And thank you so much for uh, tuning us into it and providing such a wealth of material about it. And thank you so much, Olena, also. We're very lucky to have two <laughs> experts in contemporary uh, Ukrainian art um, here in this in this panel. So again, I would like to thank Katerina Yakovlenko, who is uh, at the Shevchenko Scientific Society at the US. She's a Fulbright research fellow, and Olena Martinuk, who is our Yavtsek postdoctoral research uh, in the Ukraine Studies Program here at Hanamer University. So thank you both for a wonderful discussion and for the questions from the public. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.